Merry meet, little woman appreciators. Today's comment shoutout goes to Stop It Lol, who says the following. I just can't stop thinking about how Joe March would be a raging feminist in these days. Just imagine her speaking out about women's rights on social media and protesting on the streets. How she would go out of her ways to break the patriarchy because it's just bullshit. She would also take her husband with her. Don't tell me she wouldn't because she would. And Fritz would just stand there looking at her in awe because she is such a strong woman and he is so happy that he found her. She'd write fancy books that portray the different types of feminism using novels to explain everything because everything is more fun when you use your imagination. What makes a little woman interesting is that Jo doesn't start out as a feminist. To be honest, I don't think any one of us start out as a feminist. She's actually quite a misogynistic character for most part of the book series. And when she becomes more influenced by her sisters and Friedrich, she becomes more feminist. When Jo is with Lori, they both treat women like objects. But when Jo is with Fritz, she begins to treat other women a lot better because he does. And same happens with Laurie when he is with Amy. I always enjoy our discussions with Emily. This time we'll be talking about the portrayal of female characters in the media. And this episode is sponsored by Audible. If you are like me and you enjoy a good story, Audible is the place for you and you can use the affiliate link in the description to get 30 days free trial. And by doing that, you are supporting the making of this podcast. This is Small Umbrella in the Rain, Little Woman Podcast, Joe March, the portrayal of strong but very lonely female characters in the media. you about this right um, before I talked a few days ago or, or like last week mm-hmm. when you remember when I said oh like it doesn't really make sense how Greta Gerwig has divided up the two timelines and feel like yeah. a very happy and perfect timeline and then this really grim and like more like moody um, timeline I, I was thinking about it and I was like before I messaged you about it I was like this makes no sense because what was so rosy about the civil war about living in the middle of the Civil War when their dad is away, he could die. He could die in action. And also they were poor. And the whole reason that Marmy was angry all the time, you know, why she's angry yeah. every time of her life, is because she's watching her kids live in poverty. It's not great. And they have to save on things. And they have to um, make personal sacrifices if things were so perfect. And, uh, th- that dichotomy does not make sense. And it also takes away, of course, from the very optimistic American message mm. of the story, which is that, yeah, you take away lessons that you learned in childhood and then you apply them to adulthood to make your circumstances better. Like, adulthood is not... It, it, it's not supposed to be sadder than in childhood. Like, the, the two the two stages of life, they are connected. And so people in my video were explaining to me, oh, you see, the color grading is to see, is to highlight how one timeline is supposed to be darker than the other, and one's more optimistic and, and great. And, and I'm like, that makes it worse for me. Because... Mm-hmm. That, that goes against um, a, all the messages that I've got out of the book. One of my friends said that Joe is made to be a martyr in Greta Gerwig's film. That double timeline really shows that she's this romanticized person in these childhood images, and then this martyr in this gre- gritty, terrible adulthood yeah. images. I, I felt that they killed Beth just so Joe would become a writer. That's not why Beth exists. That really bothered me, you know, all that stuff, being this very childish, immature person when she's interacting with Friedrich, that goes against the novel as well. And and then that part of her almost accepting Laurie's proposal, what was that about? And, you know, oh, like, yeah. so it's, you know, none of that really <laughs> resonates with, with the novel. If you look at childhood with roasting classes, especially in this case, you know, you... We lose all the context that there is. 
Yeah, and basically talked a bit about how, you know, the Civil War is almost mm. pretty much erased yeah. in, in the 2018 film. And um, I think they try and bring it in maybe a couple times, like in scenes with Marmee, like when mm. she's like kind of volunteering. And, uh, but apart from that, like it feels very much absent. The, because the 1994 and, and even like the 2017 yeah. were still grounded in that reality. In fact, 2017 I think emphasizes the Civil War the most. Yeah, it does. Out of all of these, um, out mm. of all of the adaptations, because remember they they added in a part with John going off the board. Yeah, you know we had more of the their their father's perspective. Was it was a really interesting angle. I thought it was really great. That's what grounds the whole story mm. in. in reality that's that's the thing because she was saying that life is hard but you make the best out of yeah. it no matter what stage of life you're at i almost feel like greta gerwig she looked at that first part of little women so the little women yeah bit, and was like oh this is so great but then in the second part of this novel joe went off and like you know got married and like all <laughs> and my and my and my favorite couple didn't become a thing so i um like i don't like it i think it's just a statement of how like she per- her personal preference of the two books of the mm. two parts. I don't know. Frankly, it's just a, not an honest in- interpretation. You're just being very biased. In yeah. One- one part of the story versus another. Algot Scooter, Emily Birch, she did some criticism on this. Like she said that if you change the narrative of Little Woman, you so basically when the story of Little Woman is being changed, then you are just starting to spread false information about the Algots. Like if you change the narration of Little Woman, then you change the narration what people think about the Algots. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. yes. Louisa, she was a nurse in Civil War. She knew what, what the war was like. And as well. And I don't see her as... But then I guess people don't like it when she kind of settles down to marry someone. But I'm, I'm kind of like, well, no one forced her to yeah. become you know, feminine again. I, I don't think she even really even puts that um, aside. I think she just uh, is just like, well, I'm ready to be an adult, be a productive adult, like take care of my family. Yeah, I, I think she's comfortable with that. Yeah. And I think Cho is like 28 when she gets married. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. she's <laughs> super yeah. old in the 19th century context when most girls married when they were yeah. 70. But I think it's not about rejecting marriage at all. You know, when Louis was, was alive, most marriages, they weren't, you know, love marriages. And she saw lots of very unhappy marriages around her because, you know, they were not based on love. They were based on money and comfortable life. Louisa wanted to promote that idea that you should marry for love if you are going to marry someone. The Marchisters, father, the mother March, they say to make you should be 21 when you get married or older. Yeah. Nowadays, yeah. if you are 21 and you get married, people are yeah, that's way too young age to get married. Louisa is promoting the idea that a love-based marriage... She's pro um, marriage between two fully formed adults. Yeah, exactly. That's how I interpret her take on things. Because I, I don't think we have many very young marriages mm. in, in the novel, even. Because I know for Meg, you know, Marnie and their father, they actively make her delay the marriage. Like, that, uh, I mean, they, they like they like John, but they actively make, mm. um, make them wait, which yeah. is to the thing. But also, they also, they want John to be in a stable living. Yeah. You know, first, which is totally legitimate. Jo is, uh, it, it is like in her late 20s, I think, you know, Amy is, what, in her, she's got to be in her early, mid-20s when she's yeah. with Laurie, and yeah, I think she, very pro, pro find yourself mm. in the yeah, uh, which I, I think is it is not even something that we see a lot in young adult novels even uh, these days. Yeah, like, very true. Like, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, because a lot of like young adult novels is just like, oh, we're seventeen, we're gonna be together forever, <laughs> and, and we're like you know like like little bit of women. And it's just like no, you need to wait. Hold up, you're not a fully formed person yet. Mm. <laughs> and, and this is how you know that she was like a more mature woman when she yeah. was right. Like she and, um, and, and I, I appreciate it because yeah. I think that sort of like you know holding off and being like yeah maybe I'm not like a fully formed person yet I think that's a totally valid thing that we need more um, in fiction. I think this is part of the first conversation that we had this narrative that Louisa wasn't interested in love or marriage, but then yeah. you can read her diary. There was this man who she had crushes on. Yeah. 
and yeah. even considered marriage. So it is a weird narrative. Yeah, no, I think the people were very resistant to this in my in the comments on my video because they were like, no, like she admired them. She just admired these men, like you know, as artists. But that no. Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I think it was more than that. There was a lot more than that. Yeah, no, I'm I'm pretty sure a, a lot of people they. they I don't know. They're they're very res they're, they're so like attached to this one narrative of, um, mm. about her that I feel like it's they're a little bit blinded. If you went into the research without your own sort of preconceptions, then you know you would yeah. see this, which is baffling to me. How people think that Greta Gerwig did her research so much, like um, <sighs> uh, going into <laughs> making the film, because I'm I'm like the like all, all the things she's saying, all the things she did in the film. This doesn't indicate that she knew about the writer, that she even wanted to acknowledge yeah. that she had her own narrative that mm. she was in, and then she picked the bits that just in what she was saying, like the whole, like, oh, like, you know, Louisa didn't want Joe to get married, but then she wrote in a love interest just to, like, you know, please her publisher, which, you know, doesn't track when you consider that Louisa wrote, you know, what, two sequels about yeah. his marriage. Daniel Shealy, he made the research on, on the letters that Louisa wrote with her publisher, came yeah. to the conclusion that, you know, all the marriages were Louisa's idea. But it's so funny because I was doing the, the research on these stories that Louisa had been reading, the love story between Joe and Frederick and then Amy and Laura. You can trace them back to the stories that Louisa was reading as a teenager. And some of them also to the relationships that she had with these men who she had crushes on. Or maybe it was something deeper. Kind of missed the whole story if you don't pay attention to that. I was speaking with a friend of mine who's a big Amy fan, and they've been doing this research on May Alcott and then Louis's relationship with her, May. And then Julian Hawthorne, who was, you know, their neighbor, he had a crush on May. And also he was very artistically inclined and he didn't want to go to college and they may all got she was like sort of scolding him about that mm-hmm. and I was wondering oh okay like Louis might have got her some of her inspiration from there if you just say that oh, only tomboys are feminist that's only going to harm the feminist movement the political landscape now I don't know if you observe this in a lot of fiction now I think I talk about it a bit in my new video a lot of media now shows these people who need to be single in order to be strong. Star Wars Rise of Skywalker came out the same year as um, many little women. And, uh, for me, like, you know, the main character, if he's a female, she ends up alone. She's like this glorious, powerful person, and she's alone. Uh, lots of people sound very depressing because I'm like, well, this person who craves family, <laughs> like Joe, by the way, who's so lonely, really ends up alone. And I think the fact that um, Joe, in this adaptation, just goes through a very similar um, process. I mean, she ends up with her book, her glory, mm-hmm. and then she ends up alone. And that's how she remains strong and independent. Which I, I think also is very harmful to feminism as well, when you show a few modes of being strong. Yeah. Being a strong, independent female. And, yeah, and especially in the particular context mm-hmm. of that of that story, I think it's actually quite um, harmful as well because you're saying, oh, well, only Joe got to be accomplished and and the only way she was able to be accomplished was by not being with anybody and not marrying anyone, which is not not true to life. Like we discussed how Emerson was positive influence on Louisa with, with her writing. So basically, if Joe doesn't have Freddy contributing to her character arc, mm-hmm. she would have remained in this state of writing this yes. these novels that she called trash yeah. so yeah. she would not have grown as a writer and she would not have become this billionaire who like people were chasing crickets in her backyard if you erase free this character so it doesn't get her character arc at all she doesn't get her yeah. family she doesn't get to start a school and she doesn't become a writer yeah definitely i think especially in I think she also takes away some of by direct um, the influence, the mutual influence yeah. of even Laurie and Amy's mm. relationship. Because I don't think she shows how he, why this relationship works. Yeah. She never justifies that why that relationship works. But by erasing Friedrich, I mean you also erase the nature of Laurie and Amy's relationship, the fundam- the foundation of that relationship. You don't acknowledge how relationships are actually quite influential mm. in your life. 
you are just showing that, like, oh, you really shouldn't meet anyone. When in fact, you know, sometimes your partner is the person who really influence your work, really helps you to be the best person that you can be. And that is very much missing from yeah. the adaptation, and I think is a very important theme of Little Women is having someone who helps you be productive. Yeah, very true. And I direct this. Bit horror、um, quote from Louisa from the time when she was in her fifties and she was really struggling with her illness and she wrote she is envious to her sisters when she sees their marital happiness so it's it's sad how you know people just you know, <laughs> ignore these kind of things but I think a lot of people don't really like to believe that Louisa would have actually felt loneliness because she's kind of become this imaginary character for some people. One of the things that Joe does in the book, and then something that also affected Louise's life, was that she did not want that people saw her vulnerable, which is a very masculine trait, if you think about it. Yeah, yeah. There's this quote in Little Woman where Laurie is like, "You never show anyone your emotions. Like,、mm-hmm. you are this this blank face, and like, I can get true to you. You don't let anyone in." So I、yeah. think that's why this relationship that she had with Fred was important because she became a bit softer, more open. You can't always operate in like without a bit of masculine、yeah. influence, and and then Joe like、uh, aspires so much to the masculine part of herself. I think she forgets that feminine natures or feminine、mm-hmm. traits are actually really important to being a complete person as well. And I think Laurie, when she allows a feminine influence, yeah. Into his life, that's when he actually really develops. There's a moment with Laurie. He doesn't really care like, who who he's going to marry, but then he has this, all these mushy thoughts about Amy. It's it's quite funny. You can see how he's sort of transcending at that point. Maybe this is not all that there is to life. Or composing, trying to pretend、yeah. that you are a composer. Laurie's problems, I don't think they were. They didn't have that much to do with Joe or Amy. I think they had to do with his parents and his. Background and a lot of other things that are never in the adaptations, but you you really have to try to read into the subcontext of the novel to understand his mind.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he basically grows up most of his life around his grandfather. He's a bit of an austere character. He grows up with a male tutor. Even when he goes over to the marches, because he, he's craving the、yeah. influence, even if he doesn't know it. But the thing is, the person he's closest to is Joe, who's really finding、mm. her femininity in herself. She's not acknowledging it. So he has an an idea about having sort of a family and having that warmth, but he doesn't really know how to synthesize that into his life. Even when he hangs out with women, he doesn't know how to make feminine attributes. Attributes into his strengths. He only really knows how to do when Amy really sits him down and says, "You're being a really lazy person, and you're not making anything of your life." And, and then that's that's at the point when it actually goes into his mind when it,、mm. when you know he actually takes it in. I think what it comes to Joe's and Amy's essential differences. Amy is someone who she understands the way the different parts of the society work. She has this complete understanding how to behave and. How to you know approach people, make their life work for herself, but then Joe is the opposite. She believes that the society is against her. Yes. So she has this kind of idea. I need to fight against the society in order to get things. Amy believes that you work for the society, then you get things. You know, you、yes. go by with the route that has been led to you. Joe's interactions with Freddy kind of makes her a bit more Amy-like person. Because you know he guides her. If you want to break it into the publishing industry, you need to become a better writer, and this is how you do it. Then he gives her a set of Shakespeare's novels, and then he's like, you know, observe the people around you, pay attention to the characters, and Joe starts to observe him, which is really funny. And that's when she falls for him. When Joe becomes a better writer, you know, she gets into the publishing industry. She becomes very successful. So in a way, she incorporates some of these. Things that Amy did, like Amy became a positive influence in that sense for Joe as well, and she was observing the way she was getting the things that she wanted. Like you know, Joe took influence from Amy in a way.、Mm. They, they weren't they weren't in opposition to each other. Yeah.、All. But it was great talking to you. Yeah, you too. It's a great yeah, talk. We've been talking for a long time.
for almost two hours. Here. I'd love to talk with you again about um, about um, other themes mm. um, at all, if you um, if you'd like. Yeah, to. sure. And I always en- I always enjoy our conversations. I have two Little Women um, videos in mind. Actually, I'm reviewing the Little Women 2017. I mm. want to do a review on that because the commenters have been asking me to to do a review, so I'm just like, oh, fine, I'll do a review. Mm. And I also want to do another uh, video called My Favorite Five Seconds of Little Women 1994. Mm. Because... I will watch this. Yeah. Like, remember the scene from Little Women 1994 when Jill reveals that she cut her hair? Yeah. And she and Marnie actually have a moment. And I think the way that is edited and written is actually quite interesting. Mm. And I think it's kind of... The, uh, uh, for me, is actually a huge turning point in the film, and I think really sets the tone for the second half of the film as well. Okay. Um, so I want to do an analysis of that. Um, Sounds good. That, uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I'll be really interested to uh, hear other people that you interviewed on the podcast mm. as well. I know you yeah. talked about Julie Laurie with somebody. We'll probably talk online um, mm. in the meantime, and I, I guess I'll talk to you later then. Okay. It's great talking um, to you. Here is a quote from that Vermilion flycatcher. After months of having watched Little Woman 2019 for the first time, I think I have finally put into words the core of why I dislike this movie so much. This isn't going to be pretty, so you have been warned about the tone of what follows. What bothers me is the intellectual dishonesty. Hear me out. Greta Gerwig took pains on making clear that she was trying to pay homage to Louisa May Alcott's authorial intent. As if finally liberating her from the patriarchal oppression of editors perpetuated by readers and media for 150 years. The movie was also promoted not only as the ultimate take on the novel based on the previous claim, but sneakily tried to be about women finally made by women. Which went even as far as Meryl Streep saying that it was the first time it was directed by a woman, when in fact Gerwig is at least the third woman adapting Little Woman for the screen. The 1994 movie was written and directed by a woman, and so was the 2017 miniseries and the 2018 movie. The notion that the marriage at the end is tacked on reveals either bad reading comprehension or a stubborn refusal to actually read the text. The novel starts with the first separation of the March family, makes wedding, and as time passes and plot moves forward, the separation grows more and more. Jo is no longer Aunt March's caretaker. Amy leaves for Europe. Jo herself has to leave to try and make Laurie stop thinking of her. Then Laurie leaves, then Ben dies, and at the turning point of Jo's arc, she feels lonelier than ever, crushed under the weight of Beth's home responsibilities, like she has been forgotten and left behind. The plot twist is that there was someone that saw her, that knew her, that understood her, that had been loving and thinking of her all along from a distance. When adaptions forego the plot point of the poem to achieve circular structure by Jo writing Little Woman, this gets obscured. The movie acknowledges this aspect of Jo's growing loneliness, but doesn't follow through it till its last consequences, where there are other ways of solving Jo's loneliness than marriage. Sure, make her get involved in an orphanage or school in New York, make her meet good friends with which she could build a community at Plumfield, but that requires changing the structure of good wives in a significant way, and Gerwig didn't want to or, I suspect, couldn't really depart from the text that way. The way she gets around it's by mocking it, which for someone that has, as their intent, respecting the original author, is kind of nasty. There isn't a trace of irony in the ending of the book, so you are either appealing as definitive interpretation a throwaway line in a letter, or think that Louisa May Alcott is a clumsy writer. The real, truer ending seems to be the publishing of the book. But achievements don't fend off loneliness, not in a satisfactory way. Anyone that has had an achievement knows this. Publishing a book and keeping the royalties while being great in and of itself is not the natural resolution of loneliness. It's the natural resolution of insecurity or of overcoming great exterior obstacles, which is in a way an aspect of Louisa May Alcott's story, but not of chose in either the novel or the movie. 
So the movie tries to keep the canon ending because studios won't have it another way while mocking it because Greta Gerwig doesn't like it and giving an alternate ending that is left vague but also giving some crumbs to the Joe and Laurie fans with the take me back letter and the golden flashback of their friendship. And that's what I think besides of the publicity focusing on stepping on the work of other women that came before her is the core of the intellectual dishonesty of this movie. If you really think you need to liberate Louisa May Alcott, then you change the plot to take the professor out of the equation for real. If you accept the canon ending or of another expression of the author's wishes, then you keep it as a real ending, or at the very least, don't mock it. Here goes also the transformation of Friedrich's character into a jerk. I guess she's referring to the scene where Fritz says that he doesn't like just stories, when in the novel, he does not like sensationalism as a genre, and Jo herself has discomforts with sensationalism as a genre. But did Greta Gerwig thought of that? No, she didn't. She didn't even read the novel. Or well, that's what I think, because everything that she has said about it does not happen in the novel. Back to the quote. In my opinion, a refreshing way of telling the story would have been of telling the story with, within a story. Tell Louisa May Alcott's Little Woman. Show us Louisa May Alcott's struggles as an author trying to get published. Carry us through the process of writing the novel, through writing and rewriting and struggle with the editors. Show us scenes from the novel as they come to life under her pen. Give Jo her canon ending. Give Louisa May Alcott the final victory of publishing and keeping the royalties. But that doesn't seem to be the movie the studios wanted. What was wanted was another version of novel Little Woman and make it so that it has star power and comedy fees feminism. And to do so, it needs to reject marriage and femininity while at the same time do lip service to it with a throwaway. Make telling Jo that her dreams are important too never carries on into something in the plot. It needs to satisfy people that dislike the canon ending for different reasons, while still keeping it. And that's exactly what this movie does, far more than honoring our truly intent and liberating Louisa May Alcott. As an iconic line from a character in a series would say, have you ever stopped to consider the turnout of the rebellion business? Think about it. So many people fighting the system, and the system keeps getting wealthier. There are lots of really good points here. And I have heard lots of people saying that Gerwig should have done a movie about Louisa May Alcott. But even if she had made a film about Louisa, she should have included Louisa's love for Henry and her fling with Ladislas Wisniewski. Since Gerwig constantly complained about Friedrich's looks, would there have been similar issues with Henry? A lot of people of the time said that Henry was attractive but not handsome. He was handsome to Louisa. If you read Louisa's correspondence with her publisher, Thomas Niles, the only requirements he had in terms of the book was to change Laurie's looks to be more handsome. It would be interesting to know why he didn't ask Louisa to write Fritz to be more handsome, but maybe it has something to do with Friedrich's looks being based on Henry. And showing the novel, she doesn't really like pretty boys or effeminate looking guys. In the letters, Louisa and her publisher, they do discuss about branding Louisa. Like Emily and I discussed earlier, a lot of people see Little Woman as a young adult novel, but in the 19th century, Louis's brand was to be someone who wrote educational books for children. And because of that, she did not want the public to know about her past and her relationships, especially about the relationship with Ladislas, because he was so much younger. It seems that the men who she did care for and loved, they died. Men like Henry and John Surrey, then the men who were fond of her, cared more of her as a maternal figure rather than an equal partner. And that must have been difficult. I guess we could say that Louisa May Alcott was afraid of the cancel culture. And one of my friends said that someone with such huge celebrity status like Louisa had would not have opened up to the public about their loneliness because she was properly afraid that people would make fun of her and she was ashamed of it. That is actually written into Little Woman. Louisa writes that Jo was not afraid of falling in love, but she was deadly afraid of what the other people are going to say about her. She's especially afraid what Laurie is going to say, and that he is going to make fun of her, which is not something that he does, because he has grown as a person. If you demand that Jo is Louisa, 
which is what Greta Gerwig does, the bookbinding scene doesn't make any sense because it is a well-known fact that Louisa May Alcott did not care that much about Little Woman, and I 100% think it has all to do with her love life. Louisa's personal favorite book was Moods, which is a very good anthology to look at how Louisa saw Henry, and it is a book that she always went back rewriting. And then Greta Gerwig says that Jo needs to feel herself as a winner, which is why she hired a hot French guy to play Friedrich, because, quote, how could she say no to beautiful Timothy Chamalet? Those were literally her words. Jo in the novel, she doesn't lo- find Laurie attractive. She calls him girly and, and he's harassing her. And like Emily said, showing that toxic masculinity, not just in Laurie, but in his and Joe's relationship, that would make an actual feminist statement. You can't say that you are being truthful to the author and then make fun of her work. On this case, it seems to be Louisa's loneliness that is being made fun of. Now, the thing is, when Louisa first published Little Woman, she thought of it pretty highly, but the more popular the book came, and then she got more and more letters people asking her to marry Joe to Laurie, she got more and more frustrated with, with the novel. And it's like what one of my blog readers said, that if Friedrich is based on someone who Louisa was in love with, which he is, that would explain why Louisa was very frustrated by the little girls who were writing her, who were writing her and asking her to rewrite the ending of the novel. Alcott schooler Susan Bailey said that writing the happy endings for her heroes was a coping mechanism for Louisa. That goes along with Louisa's belief for reincarnation, that in the next life she gets the life that she wanted with the person she was in love with. We can say the same about writers like Jane Austen. She passionately fell in love once in her life. Family did not approve. She had to give him up. And then she relived her love story and wishes of life she wanted to have in her novels. So Louisa's liberation was not being free from her editor's request. Since regards to Joe, the editor did not make any request. Louisa's real prison was her loneliness. In the novel, when Friedrich returns, it's because he has found a poem that Joe wrote about her loneliness. That poem was based to a poem that Louisa herself had written about herself. And if I quote Chrissy West, No law waits for her except the love that she must give, neither which makes her happy. For Louisa, loneliness was not the liberation. That was the actual prison. The work alone does not satisfy her. Sometimes I wonder if more people would know about Louisa's loneliness. Would they be that much against Friedrich's character? I don't think they would be. What surprised me was that Gerwig presented herself as some sort of Louisa May Alcott expert. And then she said that Louisa didn't care about love or romance. And if you do a simple Google research on Louisa and Henry Tero and Lady Wisniewski, you know that's complete BS. And Garrick said that she wanted to do a good job with Amy and Laurie. Yeah, romanticizing Laurie and then have Jo changing her mind about the proposal. How come is that a way to honor Amy and Laurie, since none of that happens in the novel? And for those of you who have not read the book, Jo does not send any kind of letters to Laurie. Laurie actually proposes Joe again, and this happens the moment Laurie realizes he has feelings for Amy. So when Joe's response arrives and she says no, Laurie is actually quite happy about it. Someone who I know read the book for the first time after they saw the 2019 film, and they said that because Greta Gerwig had said that Louisa hated Friedrich's character, they were expecting Joe in the book not to like him. But then we are surprised when Joey the book cannot shut up about him. The team Laurie, team Bear, team whatever, that is a construction entirely made up by the filmmakers. They never show you the real reasons why Joe rejected Laurie, why she fell for Fritz. That is something that we can trace to Louise's own life. Here is a quote from Algot schooler Jamie Lynn Birch. I am interested in why why Gerwig thought it was, was so important to include anecdotes and quotations from the Algots' lives without giving the Algots a place in the film. Everyone wants a little woman to be about the Algots, says Eva Laplante, author of Marmy and Louisa. We are greeted by this fact at the very beginning of Gerwig's film. I've had lots of trouble, so I write jolly tales. The quotation reads as an epigraph, yet in some ways this film seems to disregard those real troubles, instead choosing the easier little woman as a vehicle for Louisa May Alcott's real life. 
Louisa May Alcott experienced the bizarre world of fame in her lifetime. She was asked to stand on a stage and turn in a complete circle for her adoring audience. Fans got grasshoppers out on her lawn as souvenirs. But when she answered the door, she disappointed her readers. She was not Jo March. She was not spry or youthful. When Jo lamented, I can't get over my disappointment in not being a boy because she wanted to go to war. We have to realize that Louisa May Alcott did go to war, and in the end it cost her her life. In fact, her own father said that if he had known the cost, he would never have let her go. I can think of many ways to represent Alcott in the film and keeping her separate from Joe. I can imagine a narrative voice, Hans writing in a cold house, Maybe that wasn't the story Gerwig meant to tell, yet she included so many of the details of the Alcott's own lives that it seems she wanted to. I wonder if any of this helps us to understand Little Woman any better. Little Woman can stand alone as art, without Louis's life and the other lives of the Alcott's as crutch. But I am interested in where we draw the line, in how and why we want to mislead the audience into a blurry line between life and fiction. Everything that is told about the marches affects to what is told about the Algots. Thank you for listening. Take care and make good choices.